right now, guys. Welcome back, folks, uh, from uh, Hi, the break. We uh, hope you had uh, a chance to go and uh, and visit uh, the uh, virtual exhibitors uh, throughout the program. And of course, uh, we'll be doing some more uh, Slido polls as we go forward. Uh, our session now uh, goes into part one of a two-parter on AWP Lean uh, moderated panel. Uh, and we welcome John Fish, uh, Dan Moshier, and uh, again, uh, Fernando Espana uh, working with the project. And thank you very much, Shulman. Go ahead, take it away. All right, thank you so much. So before we get started, I believe we have a, oops, a brief comment uh, by, by uh, Lloyd Rankin. I had a sure. slide here, uh, yeah, just a couple of quick things. Uh, first, uh, Fernando has asked me to uh, help him with this session. Normally, the uh, person who asks the Q and A is uh, the moderator, but because uh, Fernando is a subject matter expert in both Lean and AWP, he's also going to be joining into the Q and A. So uh, He's asked me to assist him with the question and answer period. The other thing is that uh, there's a lot of content. And again, because uh, Fernando is going to be part of the presentation, he's asked me to uh, play time cop. So uh, just make sure that the session uh, ends each section on time. So uh, you'll be hearing from me, but not seeing me. I'm gonna put my camera off in a second. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to announce is We've uh, loaded a glossary for lean terms and another glossary for AWP terms in the handout section. And we think that uh, with all the terms you've heard lately, it might be very helpful to download that and take a look at it as a reference source. So uh, that's now there for you. And I'm gonna turn off my cam and you will hear from me, but not see me in the next uh, hour and a half or so. Okay, I uh, assume everybody can see my screen. See your screen, but not your handsome face. Oh, boy, all right. Okay, I'll put that, I'll put that out there. Um, <laughs> okay, so let me, uh, let me go ahead and, and, and get started on this side. Uh, so I wanna introduce the panel first. I'm with ConstructX, uh, you know, I've been an ADP Lean and AWP Fieldless Lean service provider. And as, uh, as Lloyd said, I do have a background uh, in my experience, and that's probably the primary reason why I'm here moderating today. Uh, but I'd like to, uh, to introduce uh, two well-respected experts. So uh, our first uh, ADP expert is John Fish. Uh, so John, can you say a few words? Introduce yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm the uh, Innovation and Technology uh, Director for Ford, Bacon & Davis out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I'm also the AWP champion for our organization. So been involved with AWP uh, almost since the beginning, and uh, I'm still learning, by the way. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Dan is our lean expert. Uh, could you say a few words, introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Dan Fouché uh, with the Realignment Group of California. Uh, I'm still learning too, John. Uh, I've, I've been in construction for a little over 45 years and uh, includes development and, and design as well. And uh, been on my, what we call our lean journey uh, since 2008 uh, under the tutelage of Greg Howell and Glenn Ballard and, and other saints of lean as we call them. Um, and uh, we, we help a lot of project teams and organizations uh, figure out how to move forward with their lean uh, practices and culture. All right, thank you. Okay, so a little bit about today. Uh, this session is really set up as a series of topics uh, with questions that we pose to our experts here. Uh, they are arranged across a typical project lifecycle uh, adapted from uh, CII, and uh, we will cover the pre-construction pre portion stages uh, zero through, uh, through two here in this session. So, uh, as uh, Lloyd mentioned, uh, please ask your questions in Slido as they come up. Uh, Lloyd's going to be monitoring those questions and, uh, and will be our time keeper. Uh, keeper. So, um, with that, uh, we got a lot to cover, so uh, let's get started with uh, pre-implementation. So, I'm going to pose the first question, um, project feasibility and concept. So, at stage zero, the earliest stage where a project is defined, what lean ADP approach is applied and what key decisions need to be made? And so we're going to start out with Fish, and I'll uh, move to the slides here. Okay. 
Yeah, the uh, uh, as as I mentioned, we live in the uh, Ford Bacon and Davis lives in a revamp world. For for every major project that's out there, there's probably a thousand small projects. So, and that's the world we live in, and that produces the issue of scalability. So, one of the first things we have to look at when we identify a project is. Does eight, what degree of AWP are we going to apply, uh, implement on this particular project? Uh, the other thing we want to look at is we want to make sure that the owner has an AWP champion because if they don't, uh, we're going to have some issues here as, as we try and apply this going forward. As I said, I usually serve as our AWP champion, and we have people that I've trained to manage the projects after that point. The, the next thing is, and, and we just had that session, really great session on contracting strategy. You've got to understand that contracting strategy because it's going to be a potential barrier to your project. So make sure you fully understand that and make sure that it's realistic and it's going to be able to help you guys manage successfully. The other thing, and this was also managed, managed, uh, mentioned by Bruce in his contracting strategy, identify operations and prioritize the startup systems. Uh, those priorities are really critical and they're key to their business strategy to making this a successful project. If you don't understand those, let's always begin with the end in mind and, and the end is making product. So if you don't understand those priorities going in, you're going to have some issues, you know, along the way. And the other thing we do is is because of the modular and the and the move to modular, and we all know why that is, is we're going to go in assuming as much modular as possible, and then we'll make some decisions later on. So go to the next slide, if you would, Fernando. So this is our, our PM steps to AWP, and the ones I'm talking about now are steps one and two. Identify those commissioning priorities, number one. Understand that contracting strategy. So that's hard to get on those uh, operations people in, but you really need those people in at the beginning. And so go to the next slide, if you would. And this is the one we use for the contracting strategy. Again, begin with the end in mind, make product, come back. And what I want to take a minute here is to notice all these things, digital requirements, fabrication priorities, uh, fab by CWP in the contrast, construct by path of construction in the contract, digital sharing, digital handover. So AWP is, is very, very high. As the larger the project, the more important this digital concepts become information management. So I want to make sure those are considered and they're in the contract right up front so there'll be no issues. So that pretty much covers it for me. Dan, your turn. Hey, good. All right. Dan, let's go. Here we go. Ricochet. So uh, the, the uh, lean approach uh, to earliest decisions, uh, and, and by the way, let me interrupt myself. One of the things I've noticed in the last day plus is that many of the AWP slides are, are uh, very uh, organized, shall we say, and, and there are lots of, of boxes and sections, and so much like industrial uh, construction itself is, yeah. Uh, and and a lot of the lean slides are a little more squishy and they have more curves to them. And I think that really is a distinction between the two disciplines kind of grounded in in what uh, in what we build, uh, because, uh, you know, in vertical construction, we have things like Frank Gehry with uh, soaring structures. I don't think Frank Gehry ever designed a cracking plant. Uh, and, and so the, the, the chances are that the, the, the look of and feel of things reflects kind of how the, the approach is to it. So it, lean is in the earliest decisions, we're, we're really looking for the voice of the customer. What is the vision of the project? Uh, and it's gonna go through similar stages, uh, but what does the owner really want? And, it, and truly the, the vision is composed of not only the in, in mind as you're describing John, but, but also what is the North Star? For this project team, uh, the North Star, that the thing we follow to get where we're going, uh, and that includes the values of the owner, uh, but the values of the team itself. Uh, what are the behaviors that we want as we're designing and building this project? Uh, and so that that is kind of how we all start out, and we embrace all of the stakeholders. Uh, we do listen to the end users 
uh, bring them in, listen to, to their voice and what it is, how they're planning to use this. Because it matters if it's uh, doctors and nurses versus professors and students versus you know retail clerks. Uh, all those kinds of things will impact uh, the approach to it. Uh, and, and the stakeholders can even include the neighbors for a particular project. You don't have a lot of neighbors around a, uh, you know, a, a gas plant, but you, you have lots of neighbors around a hospital or a, around a, a university. Uh, and so all of those are part of that early vision. Uh, and then we move into the selection methods and standards. And, and uh, John and Bruce did a great job of talking about choosing the contract model, uh, integrated project delivery uh, in, in, uh, versus I2PD versus alliancing, uh, all good solid models. Uh, 50 percent, a little more than we just crossed the crossed the, the Rubicon there. A little more than 50 percent of the projects in the vertical world are now design build, and so the Design Build Institute of America has developed something called progressive design build, which is kind of like IPD's little sister. Uh, it, it, they're they're both uh, multi-party contract models, but progressive design build very often does not include the owner. In the in the contingency profit pool, uh, because it's very often a public owner, uh, and public owners can't participate in that in in most jurisdictions. Uh, so it's it's a but it's a similar model, and and so we'll kind of talk about that half of the business. Uh, we we're looking to uh, what is the selection method and standards for the team, early onboarding and organization of the team, and we tend to let teams self organize. Um, there's we develop in in lena a respect for people plan you know uh, how are we going to to uh develop our on-site support systems and and our facilities for the trades once we're in the field and and all those kinds of things what is our plan to develop a culture of respect and trust uh and trust involves communication so what are the project objectives and and how do we communicate those continuously in our onboarding plan as new people come on because as the project moves along it's developing and adding new folks we want to keep them we want to start a good culture and and acculturate them as they come in uh, very often uh, uh, the design strategy itself uh, for the for the team balance bringing in trade contractors mechanical electrical plumbing uh, at the very earliest stages uh, so that uh, all of all of the folks involved, you know, 70% of costs are locked in in the very earliest stage of design. Uh, what what we call SD, uh, what typically uh, you know schematic design. Um, and if 70% of the costs are locked in there, then you really need the people who know costs to be involved at that point making decisions. And so we'll use things like set-based design which is uh, the the idea of sets. Sets are options. So the idea of set-based design is let's uh, let's have, uh, what are our choices for structure? What are our choices for the skin? What are our choices for the HVAC system, the power systems, uh, various environmental lead kinds of things? Uh, I was on an IPD team uh, in 2008 and 2009, uh, and one of the things that the uh, target value delivery cluster group for power was considering was we were we were planning to build seven different billion dollar hospitals around the state of california for the prison system um and uh and so they were looking at all the different geographical areas and what the choices might be we could use wind power in one and we could use solar power in the desert and we could do use uh, gas turbines in a particular area and we could use uh, hydro in one, one particular area was actually available and thermal and uh was another option and so it's considering all of these choices and then in set-based design what we do is we we explore the choices not designing them all the way out but just designing them far and farther and far enough to refine how we would use them and what the relative cost would be. It's an early cost, what that relative cost would be. And so we'll we'll do a series of matching up of sets and let the owner choose uh, one from column A and one from column B kind of thing. I want that skin, so I need this structure 
and let's use this power system and it's a hospital so this is probably going to be the better hvac system and and it allows us to choose it early about on. 30 seconds okay and okay. and lock in some good decisions uh before we ever start all the way down in design and and that allows us to establish an estimated price on the street which is part of our validation process all right thank you okay so uh let's let's go to a, a question for you uh what are the implications if awp uh, or lean is not addressed at this stage so uh, I'll, I'll, let me go ahead and start out with uh, fish just a couple couple minutes or and dan please uh please chime in yeah we'll just talk about it there you go oops did i miss that one yeah so if we don't have adp or lean uh early on as you as you suggest what happens well you're you're gonna you're, basically you're gonna you're gonna miss all the all the real opportunity the da the in in awp is the a the advanced planning so if you don't make these decisions right up front you miss your opportunity on modulization you miss your opportunity for commissioning and startup priorities i mean it's it's just it's just you just don't have a chance to to pick those things up just in simplistic terms yeah dan in terms thoughts? of lean uh, in terms of lean if if these kinds of things aren't addressed early on then you end up getting stuck with something else you haven't really uh the group hasn't intelligently applied ideas to this and so you end up with less choices uh and you end up with less value very often uh, i mean you can use last planner uh, as a planning system, uh, eight weeks before punch list, uh, I, I've done it. Uh, but uh, you, you know, you, you can, if you have these kinds of opportunities for the team to collaborate, you get lots of choices for the owner and a lots more robust value for the buck. Perfect. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to pause here, Lloyd. Uh, see if we have any questions uh, that we can we can address at this point or we just we can just move on please get your questions in steve could you throw up the slido um slide no problem and uh it's this is for the audience it's really important that when something comes up uh, you uh uh, let us know right away so that we can keep you engaged in the conversation. So, um, when it comes to phase zero, uh, what, uh, if any, questions do you have for the uh, subject matter experts? And if we don't have any now, we can always catch them up on the next Q and A session. Absolutely, that works. So we'll give people just a minute and see what, if any questions they have at this point. I think we can move on to the next uh, phase. So uh, Steve, could you take down the Slido slide and uh, audience, if you do have a question related to, oh, I, they're rolling in now. Uh, so <laughs> Steve, could Late you uh, show the response? There we go. Um, can you propose the best tool of AWP based on your experience? So is there a best tool, Fish or Fernando? Wow, I think I, I'm, I'm really, really fond of interactive planning and, and uh, uh, there are many variations of that and you can do it multiple times, but this is where Lean and, and uh, AWP yeah. come together, getting the right people in the room at the right time to, to make decisions and make agreements. And, and what I really like about Lean is they focus on the commitment part, not just make the decision, but actually make a commitment to each other to deliver and then monitor that. And I think AWP may be a little weak on that side. We get in the room, we all make a plan, we all agree on it, but I don't think we follow through on the commitment part 
nearly as much. And again, like you said, Dan, uh, a lean is a little more squishy. It's a little more focused on the people and the relationships and yeah. maintaining the relationships. I think AWP is more task oriented. We're a little more focused on getting the job done. Yeah, we need you, but uh, you're not my best buddy. I'm not making that commitment <laughs> to you like I probably should. So interactive planning by far. Yeah. I don't think I've spent nearly enough time planning. Yeah, let me uh, let me build upon that too, uh, Fish. Um, I, I think one of the one of the key tools is the path of construction effort, and it sounds like it's just a, a, a that's construction yeah. part. But it drives this this alignment between engineering and procurement and my and the supply chain uh, that that we really need. And so, because there there's a a path of engineering that we don't appreciate as as we should. Uh, there's a path of procurement. There's a path of fabrication, modularization. It all needs to be integrated. And that tool with its interactive capabilities uh, really, really enables us to, to really understand how projects come together. Yep. Great. Um, there's some more questions, but I'm gonna catch them at the next Q&A portion. Uh, Steve, could you uh, uh, pull down Slido and Fernando, you wanna go ahead to the next uh, phase? Yep, okay. So let's uh, let's jump on to the to the next one. You can see my screen, hopefully. Okay, uh, we're going to jump into stage one: preliminary planning and conceptual design. Uh, this is around project definition and setup strategies. So, uh, what lean ADP approach is applied, and what key decisions need to be made? So, let's start out with uh, with Dan on this one. Sure. And uh, let me go get your slide here. There we go. So. Uh, Again, an, an overlay of the, uh, of, the, of the standard stages that we are using uh, in this series. Um, and in, in Lean, the, we, we've talked about the business case planning in stage zero, uh, and now we're talking about the validation stage. So the last planner system is part of this. The last planner system is, includes pull planning, uh, but it's really more things that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and that's where the the designers and the, uh, the builders together plan this this stage of it. We do a master plan uh, for the whole project all the way through stage four. Uh, that is at the milestone level, thirty thousand foot level. Uh, but we're really doing a a pull plan for how we're going to go through this stage. What are the issues that we're going to deal with? What are the decisions that need to be made? Uh, and and what is the concept design? Uh, and and we're starting out, you know, it, the blocking and stacking and and all that sort of thing uh, based on the vision, based on uh, the user's case uh, and and the stakeholders' needs. Uh, and and very early project planning uh, in in terms of are we going to be doing uh, prefabrication and, and preassembly? Uh, and let's let's design for for those kinds of things. Uh, how are we going to be uh, mobilizing to site uh, and and what are the site constraints? So very early site investigation is involved at this point and analysis of documents um, and and analyzing you know where the dragons are in this. Where's the where are the the difficulties and this path of construction, Fernando, I think is is uh, is relevant to Lean as well. We don't use those words necessarily, but it it is uh, is how we're going to move through design and get to where we're going. Uh, and it is at this point, to, to your point earlier, Fernando, it's at this point we talk about reliable promising uh, and we actually have discussions about how to make a reliable promise and how to hold ourselves and each other accountable for what we're agreeing to do. And, and then what are those decision points that we have to end up with? Great. All right. Well, thank you for that, Dan. Um, Fish, could you... Uh... Uh, tell us your thoughts. Yeah, uh, this is the, uh, I, I've, th these are the steps here. And, and I want to notice over here on the right side, the FEP2, FEP3, uh, we break this this particular stage into two parts. And, and uh, according to the CII model, you have your uh, uh, con conceptual stage and then you have your scope definition stage is FEP3. So we try and draw a dotted line that we want certain things to be done very early in that conceptual stage of the project. And these are three things 
things right here. As we talked about, we've made the decision that we're going to validate, that we're going to modulize everything. Well, now we're at the point where, you know, we can look at, does that really make sense? You know, because we're going to be uh, uh, looking at our construction guy is going to come in. He's going to start optimizing that plot plan, looking at sequence of, you know, starting to think about sequence of construction. So we're going to make our, our uh, decisions on pre-assembly, module opportunities, you know, right here. The other thing I point out too, number three, and again, I live in that revamp world, is identify the phases of the project. And that's extremely important in, in a revamp. You know, when you've got a freeway and, and you want to work on a freeway, you just can't go shut the freeway down and work on the freeway. You know, that ain't going to happen. You got to figure out how are we going to keep the traffic flowing, keep people safe, keep our workers safe, and still add that lane to the freeway or get that lane blacktopped or whatever. So that's what all this identify phases is. Oh my God, I got to, I got to bring in something early. I got to do this. I got to do that. And it's very important. So if you go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, these are the, when I talk about phases of work, we have what we call early opportunity in, in the industrial world, you know, early opportunity tie-in package, and, and that's a separate amount of work, and, and that's probably going to be performed by your maintenance crew out in operations. They're going to be looking for opportunities when the plant turns around or shuts down or goes out for one reason or another. They're going to make a tie-in, you know, whenever they can. Maybe an air gap work, and that's, you're going you're gonna to dismantle something and disconnect it away just so that make it safe. Uh, demo, dismantling work. Uh, you may have a, a, a work breakdown or a CWA, like say 600, and you may have a bunch of dismantling work to be done. Well, that's going to be done usually by a different crew than your construction crew in many cases, and it requires different permitting and different exercises. And then you got what we call pre-turnaround work. You're going to do a lot of work before you shut that plant down. Then you're going to have turnaround work. All of these are done by different contractors, so your are project in effect can turn into six or seven different small projects based on timing and sequence. And then you got to look at the path of construction for each small project. You're not going to dismantle everything. You're going to say this, this, and this. And then you're going to pre-turnaround work. You're going to have your, your CWAs and your CWPs. So it takes an extent, a, a revamp work takes a lot more planning and you're like I said we talked about contracting strategy and risk there's a lot of risk that has to be identified and has to be mitigated during this thing so if you don't identify these phases you're going to be putting your project and your people at a lot of risk so that's what we do at this phase great, great. thank you okay uh, so uh, next moderator question is uh, what ADP lean uh, technique you just heard would add value to the project you engage in? So, uh, you know, we're talking a little bit around production planning as well, but uh, yeah, let's, uh, Dan, Fish. Well, I'll, I'll jump in on that. I'm going to go right back to that commitment. I really think Lean has the lock on on the people part of the project and getting people to collaborate, getting them to commit to each other. And I think we can all really work to improve our that part of our project execution planning. There's a, there's a thing in Lean called standard work, and I think AWP has nailed standard work. Uh, at least it certainly sounds like it uh, in, after spending a few days with Fernando talking about it and, and uh, in the work I've been doing with you. Um, the, the discipline and the standardization and the common language and the common steps, uh, I think, are, are useful in not reinventing every time we go into a project. Uh, and that we can learn from you. By the way, there's one more thing, and you 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 just really, really tweak me, Dan. Fifty percent uh, of your contracts in the vertical world are design built. Oh yes, my God, that would be heaven for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come on over, John. Yeah, yeah. contract is the biggest pain in our butt. It makes it very difficult to execute yeah. some of these things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would also like to add uh, the early team formation. Uh, that Dan yes. was talking about, uh, you know, it's really key at this stage uh, is to have that set up. And we heard that in, in the uh, contracting strategy component as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's uh, go to the next one. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about work breakdown structure. So uh, how does the work breakdown structure evolve and how critical is it to establish an ADP lean perspective? 
So let's go ahead and uh, in this case, we're starting out with Dan again. Yeah. Uh, so I, I used to uh, I used to be a P, well, P3 then, P, P6 now uh, guy or a Microsoft project guy. Uh, so work breakdown structure was a pretty rigid process. And, and I understood that. Uh, I used to teach it around the country. Uh, and then I had I learned lean and and my eyes were open. The, the scales fell off my eyes. Uh, and what, what I learned was that uh, uh, that instead of having one or two or three people figure that out, uh, in uh, which is more typical in at least the vertical and horizontal world uh, uh, involving critical path method scheduling, instead of instead of a few of us figuring out and being the lone geniuses uh, who who figure out the work breakdown structure and the path of construction, it it actually is the team. Uh, and so in the last planner system. Uh, several people have correctly identified earlier that the last planners are the ones that the work face, the superintendents and foremen of those folks, but the last planner system involves a much larger group. Uh, it involves all of the folks uh, in, in designing and building and, and, uh, and the owners. Uh, and so we first do milestone planning and we set the milestones. I mentioned 30,000 feet uh, is a, a kind of an example that that speaks to me. You can, you're really seeing the big picture. You're not. You can't read house numbers uh, from 30,000 feet, but you can see the big events. You can see chunks of cities and things like that. Uh, and and so that's where uh, the overall uh, understanding of the project begins is the setting the milestones. Uh, and then we fly the plane down to 10,000 feet and start phase pulling smaller chunks of three or four months at a time, specifying handoffs. All right, we're going to shift to the next slide. Dan? Yeah, I don't, I don't see the next slide coming up, but anyway, I'll keep talking. Uh, very good. So this is this is kind of the way we do it in uh, in horizontal construction. Is that uh, we'll we'll lay out uh, what the what the the overall project is. This happens to be an airport terminal uh, and uh, at LAX, and and we'll we'll identify what the areas are going to be, and we'll begin to to plan the path of construction as well as the overall work breakdown. How we're going to work in these various areas. There are different requirements in various areas, uh, and the little tags on the lower left are the are the post-its, uh, formatted post-its that you see where people are are uh, are each different trade or or entity has its own color, uh, and we do our planning both at the milestone and the phase pool level uh, in in these kinds of things, specifying what are we what do we need to do our work and uh, and what are, what are the handoffs. Uh, that are most effective and efficient to do that. So the evolution of lean work breakdown is looking at the site map uh, and the site itself uh, and, and working our way down from the very highest milestones all the way down to the very specific week-to-week uh, -week and day-to-day -day kinds of things. All right. Okay, thank you. So let's, uh, let's move on to uh, Fish. Okay, the uh, uh, I think this is a place where again, lean and AWP are, are are very much in alignment. Slightly different, but we're accomplishing the same things. Uh, what what I didn't emphasize in my last talk there about the importance of the construction guy optimizing that plot plan. I kind of skipped that a little bit. That's a very very important step, and I'll get back to that in a minute. But in the process, he's going to define the CWAs and CWPs. We want the guy who's going to build the project defining those kind of things, not engineering. If we can. Uh, now, sequence of construction, again, you mentioned that, Fernando, that is extreme. We call a path of construction. It's just this is the sequence that we plan to build the project on, and that's going to drive the path of procurement and the path of engineering, like you stated. So we, we need to really focus on that, and then we're going to conduct that interactive planning when this is where we secure the alignment with everybody, uh, all stakeholders in the room, and, and it's really procurement and engineering. The question is, can you guys 
I support this path of construction. And, and if there's any issues there, we need to identify them. We need to identify the risk and see if we can mitigate that, or we need to adjust our path of construction to something that's more realistic. So let's go to the next, next slide. So this is, uh, uh, whoops, was that, uh, uh, go, uh, okay. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so so there you go. These are the steps right there. We're going to interactive planning. So go to the next one. All right, this is very similar to what what we saw before. This is a, a, a typical unit in a in a refinery, and we start with the plot plan, and we start identifying those CWAs or major groups of work. You can debate on what a lot of debate on what size these ought to be. Uh, we usually look at them at the superintendent level, or in some cases, if it's a fast track project. And in this particular case, that 100, 600, and 200 were all done by different contractors. We actually put different, you know, construction contractors on there because that way they were being built simultaneously rather than sequentially. And we wanted each one of those contractors to have a priority one. We didn't want a contractor with three priority ones. So that was our, our logic behind that. So a lot of reasons why you would divide these things up and based on size and so forth. So then go to the next one. At the, at the next point, oh, I'm sorry, next slide. So the next slide now we're gonna we're gonna divide that that we take one of those units like that 600 area and we're gonna divide that into construction work packages our little smaller bite chunks and our construction work packages will be by discipline the, the piping in this area the foundations in this area the structural steel in this particular area usually these are foreman size chunks. Uh, we usually sign you know, a superintendent maybe over the whole area, and he'll say, okay, foreman, you have 603, foreman two, you have 604, you know, et cetera. Again, a lot of variation in how you want to divide these up, but they need to be sizable chunks. And, and again, uh, that's going to be the construction guy who's going to map all of this stuff out. So go ahead to the next one. And oh, in the process, he's going to define, am I going to do the pipe rack first? Usually I'm going to do the pipe rack first. I'm going to do the pipe rack starting on the north side to the south side. I'm going to go out into 603, then out into 604. So he makes all these sequences, you know, path of construction decisions at that point. So go to the next slide. So now we've got everything going, we got a path of construction, but but it's got to be validated. And here you go in, into the to the um, uh, interactive planning sessions. And there, by the way, there's some very critical inputs. We'll talk about those in a minute. You don't just go into a interactive planning session, but notice the little stickies down there on the wall on the, on the bottom corner. We actually get the disciplines in there with stickies. We want the discipline. And, and the big danger here, guys, is you get a project controls person in there and a project controls is going to facilitate this and he's going to try and make a schedule out of it no no don't get a scheduler in there to do this get the guys who are actually the engineers each discipline civil guy structure guy piping guy process engineer they all need to have their color stickies and they need to get in a room just like Dan said, you start out with milestone planning. Over here is startup. Over here is mobilization. Over here is, you know, you got those, here's funding. You know, there's some there's some key milestones that are going to hold you up in the contract. You put those on the board, and now everybody's got to start putting their stickies. Engineering likes to work from the front, and they go backwards. That's just the way. They can't work backwards. Engineering has to work forward. So they start out at the beginning with the process engineer, and they work forward. My construction guy is going to start with startup, and he's going to work backwards and invariably those two are going to cross well there's your problem area now we got some issues so now you start negotiating and find out well what can we do reasonably do uh, you know everybody in engineering wants more time and construction wants more time well maybe you'll get it maybe you won't the owner's in the room he'll make that decision nine times out of ten you're not going to get it so you better start negotiating and figure out what can we do, identify risk and mitigate those. But the main thing is, see that celebration? I think you had the same thing, Dan. Yeah. Those guys down there at the bottom, we did it. We got a yeah. plan. We have agreed that this is something we can do. That's what you want to come out there with. Go to the uh, next slide, if you would. Now, this is your input to support interactive planning. You're going to need a lot of information, especially in relation to funding, mobilization, mechanical completion, startup, your vendor data. Uh, vendor data drives engineering. 
and and that's going to be your big pinch point and we and and in today's world with supply chain and shortages it just looks like you cannot purchase your major equipment early enough to get the vendor data to the design team to get this thing going to support the path of construction a lot of issues right here and that's just a challenge for the entire industry but you got to look at your fabrication strategy pipe and steel what are your lead times what are your deliveries all of that data goes into this interactive planning so without the input uh, the owner of my company, SMB, Jimmy Slaughter, he says his famous motto, I remembered it from day one, manage inputs, never manage your outputs. If you get your inputs right and you got a good process, the outputs will come. So that's what we focus on at this stage. John, the, 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 all those color stickies make me smile, man. You, you... <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you, Dan, uh, you know, uh, where are the similarities here? Uh, from from what you see uh, in terms of AWP and, and applications, uh, I mean, uh, we all use post-its. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. The, uh, I, I, we need everybody to work from the from the end backwards to pull backwards, yeah. uh, because pulling backwards uh, allows people to specify what they need in order to start that work, uh, yeah. and that then becomes the tag in front of it. Uh, and and we it would be very unlikely that we would allow people to 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 try to meet in Utah and drive a golden spike. Um, the uh, the other thing is that that uh, we would more likely have additional not just the engineers there but the trades. Uh, but that's the difference in the industrial and yeah. and you know vertical kind of thing. Uh, we would have the trades doing a lot of that work, doing most of that work. Uh, knowing what they need uh, in order to do that. Or if it's full planning and design, we would have the actual designers uh, actually doing that uh, along with their consultants for mechanical, electrical, and plumbing and, and uh, you know, furniture and whatever. Um, and, and so I think that's the similarity and the difference. Yeah. And uh, just a quick comment. Uh, I think we have a little time here, but on the engineering perspective, you know, I think uh, this is where the opportunities that you said earlier, the target value design, where those conflicts that that Fish was mentioning, yeah. you know, you can look at that set based design. You can start start looking at all those alternatives yeah. to what are get some choices. Yeah. Yeah. And if well, we know that one. those are going to be conflicting early, we can yeah. price the choices early and 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 make good decisions before we lock in a mistake. Yeah, sorry, John. One other thing I wanted to admit down there towards the uh, bottom uh, on the right hand side, it says approval durations to purchase. Uh, this is extremely Im important. I I've mapped out what I call the uh, 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 steps to procure. And, and in order to procure a piece of major equipment in the industrial world, it takes approximately 17 steps. And, and in those steps, and, and it's a lot of governance, it's a lot of, I want to see this, and this guy need to approve it, and that guy need to approve it, and then it goes to this guy, and, and it, go, it just goes, I mean, you're passing that potato on down the line, and I got 600 pieces of equipment to purchase, and, <laughs> and where is that purchase order, you know, down in that line, it's, it's like, where is the potato in that line, you know, and who's got it, who's got custody, and how long do they need it, and everybody will tell you that I need two weeks, I need two weeks, well, you cannot execute a project if everybody in that potato line needs two weeks so you better get agreement right up front on uh, who needs to approve what and where it is and how long it's really going to take because your schedule isn't worth a flip if you haven't got the client and the subject matter experts and I stress SMEs uh, they have a lot of power in the owner side, and you really got to manage those SMEs to make sure that you can make these scheduled deliveries and commitments so it sounds like an opportunity for process mapping, John. 17 steps may be a few too many. Well, uh, well, well, that's the first thing I do. I say, look, here's your 17 steps. Now, let's figure out, do we really need this step? Good. Can I All do right. this step concurrently? Can I do I? you know, so you take those 17 bubbles and you demonstrate to them that if you want this, your project is going to move out six months, pal. Yeah. And so then you start getting rid of those bubbles. But if you don't say anything, those bubbles are there and they're going to enforce them. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Here's the, uh, the next uh, question. Um, so this is around early project planning. What lean ADP approach is applied and why is it effective? So uh, let's start out with, uh, with fish on this one. And I think I've got some slides here for you. 
Okay. And, and again, that, that conceptual design or is, is, is the critical to secure that alignment. And I keep putting that in, in procurement and engineering. And, and, and when I talk about procurement, uh, this is what I call a fragmented process. A lot of our owners want to do the procurement on the owner side. Now you got some owner procurement people, and they do not, and they may be, you know, we're down here in Louisiana. Those buyers may be in New Jersey, you know. They don't care about your project. They've just been told to buy stuff, and they've been told to get the best price. So they got plants coming in from five different locations, and they need each one needs five pumps. So they're going to try and put them all together and get the best price. They don't care about your schedule. They don't have a commitment to it. So you got some real issues there on the procurement side if you're not in control of the procurement. So be very it's just a warning there about a fragmented process. And so the then then the other thing we're going to do we're going to look at the ability. I call them the abilities planning. In, in the early stages there, you're going to look at constructability, you're going to look at operability, and you're going to look at maintainability, and all of those need to be explored. And we use a conceptual model at this stage to actually lay these things out and make sure that they're all right. You don't want to wait till you get into detailed design and find out you, you don't have the right constructability or operability uh, sequences. Uh, the other thing is to establish roles and responsibilities and work processes that are going to support this thing. Um, and also you're going to initiate that, I told you that conceptual model, and that's going to become the basis of the TIC estimate. So all the things you're doing here, you're setting up, these are the basis of my estimate. And that has to be the, the, the plan going forward. Because if you put in that estimate, and then after the estimate is submitted and you decide to change the plan, you got a problem. Uh, go to the next slide, if you would. And, and these are the steps we're doing there. We're aligning those. Uh, the other thing is, is, you know, we came up with CWPs. Now we're making sure that our engineers are defining their EWPs. And was pointed out yesterday, an EW, a CWP may have one or multiple EWPs in there. We need to figure out what all those are so that we can manage those and make sure that we get the right priorities in the EWPs, especially in the area of steel and pipe fabrication, going to the fabrication shops. Uh, we need Initiate that formal constructability, you know, at this point, and that includes scaffold planning and scaffold management. Scaffolding will kill you on, on a project of this side. And we won't. We tell our designer we don't want them starting that model until we finished all these steps because their model has to be AWP compliant, and that means it has to have those boundaries for CWAs and, and CWPs and EWPs. They have to be built in to that model in order for that to be handed forward to our last planner, field planner, so that he can use that model, you know, to to uh, put together his installation work packages at the site. So so that's what we're doing at this stage. Oh, I'm sorry, this is uh, just this is another slide on the uh, what we do to initiate constructability. We have a formal process, you know, for doing that. Uh, but I'm not going to go through this, but but the, the big steps there, we got a kickoff. We have our checklist that we use. We meet with the discipline leads. We meet with the construction guys. We discuss which one of these on the checklist are really going to add value for this particular product project. Then we look for cost-saving ideas. I think that's very similar to Lean now. We're trying to improve that process, you know, and deliver value. And we there's a lot of things we can do here that can really save some money. And, and our discipline leads are really, really good at coming up with good ideas, and we give them a lot of credit for that. And so then we get the uh, uh, CM to review the entire design. And, and look at the things we're looking at here. Uh, where we put weld location, field weld locations, is extremely critical, and we make that visible in our model to make it easier for the construction guys to see where these are. All right. Thank you. Okay. Dan. Lee. All right. Well, uh, I've, I've got one slide i think <laughs> um the uh, the idea of set based design versus point based design of target value delivery uh, of moving everybody up front that yellow curve is uh, at, at the bottom there is all the people uh, all the people in early preliminary and schematic design and design development uh this is the, uh, laid overlaid against the classic mclamey curve the blue line is is the ability to impact change, and the red line is the cost of making changes. Uh, and it the you know the cost of making changes 
goes up dramatically the further you are in the process, and the ability to affect change goes dramatically down the further you are in the process. So in, in traditional construction, design and construction, uh, we would focus on, uh, on construction documents, on, on developing documents, uh, but that means that the, the designers are, have less creative time and that if you make any change, it's costly. So by moving folks up front and using set-based design with target value delivery, uh, we're, we're able to make better design decisions early and cost them out and design to a cost. And it's at this point early on that we'll set the estimated cost based on that 70% uh, of, uh, of things that are locked in in that left side of preliminary and schematic design. We have an estimated cost for this project and, and what it will cost us to do it on the street. And then we'll choose early on in design development, probably, uh, the team will pick a target cost, which is below, uh, it's a it's an aspirational target cost. We, we're really gonna try to hit it. And interestingly enough, in target value delivery, because the delivery of target value continues through construction, uh, we'll actually be able to hit that and maybe improve on it. One of the things I saw in one of John's slides, he said, define expectations. One of the very essential elements of this process is what we call conditions of satisfaction. What are the conditions of satisfaction for a milestone, for a particular design concept, for a particular uh, uh, piece of the design? What are the conditions of satisfaction? How will we know when we're done? What's done look like satisfactory to the owner? Uh, and so we have a lot of similarity, John, with defining expectations and this concept of conditions of satisfaction. Yep, and that's huge. I didn't spend enough time on that, but we, we do focus really on identifying the expectations and managing those expectations. Yep. And it's kind of a trade. If you want that from me, then here's what I need from you in order to make that happen. Yeah, the ability to make a reliable promise requires right. that kind of negotiation. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so here's the uh, the next question is, and you already started answering this, uh, what ADP lean technique you just heard would add value to the projects you engage in. So Fish, you know, you can speak on, on from a lean uh, perspective and Dan on the ADP side. Um, anything else you want to add? Now, I keep going back to the people side. I really like the commitment side, the relationship side, the the focus on the the uh, something that's probably new to us is this target value. Uh, we don't really focus on that. I think that's something we may look at a little closer. There, there's some real opportunities there. Uh, right now, I don't know anybody that's not on our radar, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting concept because it means that you could get more for less. Uh, if everybody contributes to figuring yeah. out how to do that, right. uh, which is pretty cool. It's the yeah. opposite of value engineering where you get less for less. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah. And we and do what, value engineering. We do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's And that's that's a point maybe, Dan, you can speak to this a little bit on some of the lean projects I've engaged in, especially on the IPD side. Uh, it In this early stage, you can, you can start forming these cluster groups that start uh, – Folk, you know, start looking at these different uh, opportunities to, to drive value. And that's what that early in, engagement, uh, I think. Uh, exactly. So you're using the word cluster group. In target value delivery, we identify the clusters and structure. I mentioned some of them. Structure may be a cluster. Skin may be a cluster. Uh, HVAC, power. Uh, each of these groups will uh, maybe six or eight people. Uh, the, not six is better. Uh, but six or eight people, uh, and, and it includes three or four subject matter experts, someone to lead the group who's also on the core team, uh, which is kind of how the thing is organized, uh, and it includes a professional amateur, uh, someone uh, who doesn't know anything about this discipline. So the landscaper comes in and sits on the plumbing uh, cluster group and, and asks the stupid questions that the subject matter experts would be ashamed to ask but we need to challenge our assumptions so that this you know the, the goofy amateur comes in and says well why are you doing it that way and and we all go gosh i don't know we've always done it that way uh and and, and then the plumber may sit on the landscaping uh, cluster group uh and and what they do is 
in considering all these different choices, they'll develop an A3. A3 is, is a Toyota invention. Uh, and it's, uh, it's it, the, the, word, the letters A3 describe the size of the sheet of paper, which in the US is 11 by 17 inches. But it also is a process of background and current condition and, and uh, you know, target condition and, and, uh, and plan to get there and that sort of thing. And it's a collaborative document that on one page summarizes everything we learned. And, and so instead of reading a 20 page report, which nobody reads, you read one page and it's all there, including all the graphs. Excellent, thank you. So uh, I'm going to uh, shift over to, to Lloyd and see if we have any uh, questions that we should be addressing at this point before the break. Sure, if, uh... Steve, could you pull up uh, Slido again? And Dan, um, yes. just one question. I heard uh, Fish say what he thought um, AWP could take away. Um, what do you think that uh, Lean could take away from AWP based on the previous conversation? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going back to that standard work thing. Uh, when, when we do last planner in construction, which is we're not talking about right now, we're talking about planning, but I'm just saying, when we do last planner in construction, we run into all kinds of constraints, things that didn't happen like they should. Uh, a design that didn't get finished or an, a, a piece of equipment that wasn't delivered on time or whatever. And, and all of that enormous rigorous checklist and standardized kinds of things and the packages that must be complete, that is really smart. We would have a lot fewer constraints in the construction side of work uh, and frankly in the design as well. Uh, were, did we, if we had that rigorous kind of Packaging uh, to make sure that all of the of the I's are dotted and all the T's crossed. Great, thank you. Um, so, if you take a look at the Slido, you'll notice that there is uh, over on the right hand side. Right now, it's all zeros. Um, just like on Facebook, you can like things, and if you like them, it actually increases uh, where the ranking is. And this way we can we can address the questions that most people are interested in hearing about. So uh, could you please uh, take a minute to go and vote on the questions that are there and also uh, continue to add new questions. So the first question I'm gonna ask the panel is, when you apply last planner on your pull plan, how do you deal with people not meeting their original commitments? You shame them and make them stand in a corner and put a dunce hat on. No, you, actually you don't. Uh, what you do is you ask why five times. Uh, you, why, why did you miss that commitment? Okay, and whatever answer you get, it's probably an excuse. So why that? And then why that? And then why that? And then why that? And by the time you ask it five times, you've exhausted their BS meter and they'll actually figure out the answer. And then that's what you go to work to fix. Uh, we don't shame people and we don't deal with the metric. Uh, we call it PPC, percent of plan complete or percent of promises complete is my preferred phrase. We don't deal with that on an individual basis. We deal with it on a team basis. So there is team pressure to keep our reliability higher. On Without last planner, it's 54%. Half the time people do what they say they're going to do and half the time they don't. And with Last Planner, with almost all of the teams I coach, it's 80 to 90%. And that's a huge difference. So when there are anomalies, you ask why. And you really want to know why. It's not why, it's why. Uh, because you really want to know why. And then you want to go fix that because it'll probably happen to somebody else. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to that, uh, actually, uh, in a lot of my experiences, uh, what we find it goes to the sociology part and and actually what fish said earlier people people come to these projects with already their mental models already in place I, this is my job i'm supposed to know all this why am I, why are they asking me these things and what we come to find out is they really never uh have been trained properly to plan in the way that's most effective for the pro project and that's there that's getting engagement uh and uh you know one of my first ones uh, i had a mechanical contract just refused to say anything and you know, finally, I you know, I asked him, you know, what, um, why are you hesitant about getting, getting up here? He goes, well, 
because I'm sitting here listening to all this and no one's really asked me to stand up and go over, you know, and, and ask me the right question. So all we have to do is ask him the question, can you please come up and contribute to this? And boy, it just opens up. So, so it goes back to what Dan said, you know, it, it's the five whys. People are really not thinking this way. They're, 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 they've never been allowed to, to speak this way. As you mature, of course, the culture sets in. And I think that same thing with lean and ADMP is that when you get that culture, this is the way we behave, this is the way we respond, it really does drive a difference. And uh, John, I know that uh, AWP never has people not meeting their commitments, but do you have any uh, <laughs> comments to that question? No, we we uh, we we are probably aren't as kind. We, we, we maybe ask two whys and, and rather than five. Uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, why we, don't you want to work here? <laughs> Great. Well, thanks for that. Um, so let's go to the next question. What are the challenges to how uh, you get trade partners to buy into either AWP or uh, Lean? Uh, I, I'll take it up on on and in my world, you know, my, the biggest ones I look for is is piping. Well, you you got some critical equipment suppliers, but for the most part, it's pipe fabrication and steel fabrication uh, are the ones. And and we have what we call our preferred suppliers for pipe fabrication and steel. I got I've got three of them, depending on they each have different areas of expertise, and uh, I, I bring them in in many cases uh, just for their advice and let them know that hey, look, I may very well have to bid this steel package you may not be the one selected but uh, i want to make sure that I, I need somebody in here that can talk to me realistically you know what's the market look like you know how what can you do how can you help us on on priorities and explain to them the the prior priorities that we're really going to need on this project and is there a, even a chance uh, of delivering those and what are the risks and what are the costs and they do pretty good about that because they know if they don't get this one they're probably going to get one of the next ones so the, the, again, I'm building that relationship with my suppliers and I'm building that trust with my suppliers and I have to treat them fairly. I can't abuse them when we do this. For Lean, it's, if, uh, if it's the beginning of a project, uh, we'll do a little bit of training. Uh, hopefully we'll do a simulation that, uh, that they can hands-on participate in that shows yeah. them, uh, you know, we'll let, let them try to build something uh, without planning, without full planning. Uh, and just, you know, they're experts, go build this thing and uh, with their hands and uh, they take it takes them 20 minutes, uh, 25 minutes. And then we'll show them how to pull plan this simple exercise and they'll build it in five minutes. Uh, and very often that that's the realization moment. Uh, if it's if it's middle of the project or later in the project, pain is a prod to understanding. They're failing and they realize that they need something different and the last planner is going to be their solution and that will bring them uh, to the altar. Yeah, and uh, one thing I'll, I'll quickly add to that, I, I believe some of the, if we get down to the root cause, sometimes we have leadership failures. So leadership yeah. leadership is not sitting behind it. And when you get uh, owners that demand ADP, demand lean, they put programs together, they put the process in place and they, they, they tend to uh, you know weed out folks that really aren't going to behave. So the primary motivation is, hey, this is a requirement if you want this job uh, from an owner perspective. And uh, early in healthcare, that's exactly what drove folks to behave. And with ADP, now that we have a lot of uh, process and oil and gas and, and uh, process folks demanding ADP, people are also asking the question, well, I got to learn this stuff real quick and be part of it and show I can do it. Otherwise, I'm not getting work. There are simple one page contract provisions you can toss in to get everybody to buy into it by mm -hmm. contract. So we're going to take one more question and then we'll go to break. Um, and I'm going to modify the question a bit because I think it's a great question, but I think it applies to both Lean and AWP. Um, can you apply AWP or Lean just to an extent? For example, uh, can you just focus on uh, the uh, execution? Can you just focus on the front end planning? Do you have to do both. Uh, what if you can't do engineering? Can you still apply lean and AW? 
So uh, I'll, I'll jump in on that one, Lord. The, the, uh, yeah. we, we all, I think most of the construction guys started out doing work phase planning. In other words, you you get a bunch of stuff out there in the field. You got a planner out there and he starts looking at well, what can I do and putting together packages. And, and so, yeah, you can do that, but it's not AWP. You're just doing, you know, work phase planning. You're doing planning at the job site based on what you have available. The A in AWP says, hey, let's move to the front of the train so that we can make sure that what we want is going to be available when we need it in order to meet that path of construction or optimum sequence. So, yeah, you can, I, I say you can do workplace planning, but it's not AWP unless you've got somebody up there in front planning the thing, you know, and making sure that you've got that flow of information, flow of materials, flow of, uh, of fabrication to support the desired path of construction. Yeah. For Lean, it's a very different answer, isn't it, Fernando? Yeah, I, I would think so, but uh, go ahead, uh, take, take well, a shot. Um, the, there are a lot of people that dabble in Lean, and they get dabblers' results. Uh, so it's, it's how much results do you want? Uh, it is a great system, uh, but it is a system that you can adapt to your organization or to your project. You can use only the last planner part of it, and you'll get some great planning and scheduling output as a result of that. Uh, if you add additional elements to it, you then develop the culture, uh, you're gonna get far more bang for your buck. And if as an organization, you, you do continuous improvement, now you're really singing. Uh, but it's, uh, it, you, you can take a bite or you can, you can have a banquet. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and Lean allows you to make those choices. Yeah, and I, I would answer that question absolutely uh, yes. And uh, the, the other question is, should you? Yes, because the consequences, the implications, if you don't, is worse yeah. off. Unless, of course, you're in the change order business, then yes. that's okay. Yes. So if you're in the change order business, don't listen to anything we say from here from this point forward. But if you're really trying to add value, uh, no. wherever stage you're in, implement some form mm -hmm. of, of work-based planning or lean, or lean thinking, lean construction, last planner. Uh, you're going to get benefits and the project will be better off if you is you know it, better off uh, in the long run is if you didn't and if you're an owner i don't know why you wouldn't want to do this yeah it just doesn't once you understand it why. it doesn't make sense I, why you wouldn't approach it. no hey, steve could you take down the slido question please questions we'll come back to them later uh we're going to be heading into a break now and um, uh, we are a few minutes over but we're still going to come back from the break at the same time, halfway past the hour. So um, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to hand it over to Rob now. Thank you, folks. And uh, again, as we take the break, uh, please uh, go and visit uh, you know, virtual uh, exhibitors. Uh, and uh, if you have any additional questions that you would like us to cover, uh, in the second half of this presentation, you can go ahead and start putting those in into Slido for us. I want to thank our group uh, and also Lloyd for doing the additional part of the moderation. And we'll see you again uh, in about uh, 20 minutes. Yeah. Welcome back, everybody. We hope you uh, had a good break. And now we'll continue with the second half of this. Uh, we will be breaking again at uh, 1230 for lunch, and it will be a full hour. Uh, and then we'll come back at uh, 1.30 Central uh, of the second half of the program. Gentlemen, take it away. Okay, perfect. So uh, thank you. We just uh, finished up stage one uh, and now moving into stage two, detailed production design and engineering. So I think stage one is what uh, what we all would think of as setting us up for success. Now we got to get roll up our sleeves and actually get some, get some of the work done based on those excellent results. So um, I want to start out with uh, the first part of stage two, the topic, which is approach to detail design and engineering. So uh, what lean ADP approach is applied and why is it effective during detail design and engineering? And we'll start out with uh, Fish on this one. Okay, the, uh, <clears throat> the, the big thing about detail design, as, as I had stated before, our company is, has a mandated that we're gonna, our standard deliverable is an AWP compliant 3D model that will feed forward 
to support the last planner, the field planner, in developing their IWP work packages. So that that put a whole new spin on things. The 3D model is no longer a picture of, of what things are going to look like. The 3D model is the basis for planning the project and and actually statusing the project. So we have a very elaborate information management system built around this. And I know there's some suppliers out there that provide that same service for everybody and 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 data integrity is the key so what we have to do we got to make sure that our people understand the importance of managing data and they don't i mean these guys are picture drawers that's what they do they draw pictures and 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 lines and they don't understand the data behind it so managing data is extremely important and there's a joint working group in the uh ada in the cii called uh, the awp and uh and data management uh, information management group What's the role of information management in the future in these projects as we move to digital design and, and data requirements? So a lot of issues to, to explore right there. Uh, next slide. Uh, we've developed this fairly elaborate set of standards. By the way, the, uh, the, the disciplines themselves came up with this. We said, look, guys, you've got to name your model something. Why not work together? so that when you name it, we can actually use that data and move it forward to the guy in the field. So they worked, and they probably worked six months on this, and they did what I thought was a beautiful job of coming up with standards that they could all live with. And, and you know, a lot of people say, well, man, doesn't this add a lot of hours to your engineering? The answer is no. Once it's established, you're going to name that model something anyway. You might as well name it in a convention or a standard that can be used for data management, you know, going forward. So I'm not going to get into a lot of detail. I, it doesn't make any difference what conventions you come up with as long as they are consistent and the people understand them, they're easy to use, and they feed, feed the information forward. And then in order to, uh, because, uh, Dan, we're not quite as trusting maybe as lean. <laughs> so, trust so we but actually verify, have, John. <laughs> yeah, trust but verify. <laughs> so we actually have this audit that we do. We sit down with the disciplines when they're before they're preparing their estimates, and we say, look, guys, here are the requirements for a for a, a AWP compliant model. Let's sit down on this project and let's go through these things. Make sure you understand them, that you're able to do these things, each discipline. <clears throat> and start out with the project manager first, by the way, and then each discipline. And they're supposed to say yes to everything. I mean, that's you have an AWP compliant model, you would say yes to everything. And then they fully understand what this means. Now, there's going to be, because we talked about scalable, there's going to be those projects where, yeah, it doesn't really make sense to do this. You know, okay, then mark no. But when you mark no, your project manager is going to have to go to the operation manager and explain to him why he doesn't think that's a good idea. And if the, he, if he sells the project man or the operations manager, that's fine. That's good, but at least we have this this process that we go through. And I did see one of the questions, uh, Dan. It said it seems like AWP puts more emphasis on the tools and the process, and and Lean puts more process on uh, emphasis on the people and the relationships and commitments. And I think that's a true statement. Yeah. We we have more tools in our box, I think, to kind of get people to comply. I hate to say force to comply, but at least tools for checking to make sure that they, they are complying. We have audits that run overnight and look for data, what we call orphans, data integrity strays. And then we put every month, not overnight, we do it every week. And every Monday, we give this list to each squad leader and said that here are the orphans you have in, in your particular model. We actually have a dashboard so that I can score them and trend them and say, you know, Instrument's doing really good on data integrity. Piping, you're slipping, you know, you've got some issue to do. So there's a little bit of it if you watch them, yeah, they, they will improve. And, and they seem to get, get, they get on the program with that. So they're pretty much graded as a lead by how well they manage the data, you know, on a project. So, so data integrity, uh, uh, and the, go to the next slide. That brings us to tag integrity. And we have a, a little thing that we call, uh, and we'll see it in one of the slides coming up, trial 
allocation. And, and what we want to know and what we track in our models, matter of fact, we actually have a visual progress model so that we can see when an ISO is in check, when an ISO has been issued for uh, uh, approval, when an ISO has been issued for fabrication or construction, the actual, that pipe section in the model actually turns a different color. So you can look at the model and you can see where things are, you know, pretty, pretty easily. Same thing when we when we buy things like a piece of equipment, it'll show you that it's been purchased, that the vendor data is here, that it's been received at the job site, that it's been installed, etc. None of that, none of that will work if the the pump is labeled P-101 on one document and it's P-101 on another document. It just goes astray. So you got P and IDs, you got control lists, you got a 3D model, you got ISO, you got drawings, your purchase order. All of those things have to have tag integrity. I cannot stress that. And I think I told this story uh, earlier in, in the session yesterday. We have an owner who's trying to sell their facility and I think they have 13 units or something like that, but they ran a tag integrity check on one unit and they found 9,000 issues. So now somebody has to go into that owner file and figure out why do I have 9,000 tags that don't seem to match up to anything, you know? So, so that integrity is becoming more and more of an issue. I think in the, in the design phase, we really are focusing on ensuring data integrity. One other thing I didn't mention is model reviews. Um, the old tradition was that we hold a 30% a model review, a 60% remodel review, and a 30% model review. Well, we've pretty much gotten rid of those. First off, there's misnomer. It's really hard to say when you're 30, 60, 90. We have more criteria in there that, hey, the, the very first model review is to make sure that we have the equipment and major structures set with uh, those abilities, maintainability, mm -hmm. operability, you know, constructability, installabilities, things of that nature. The second one is looking at the major piping systems and control points. Do we have those in place where they, again, operability, maintainability, you know, uh, operability. And the third one starts looking at, with, then the next you start looking at your piping. But in reality, we really design by system. So we take a major system and we may have after that second or third, second model review, we end up having a bunch of model reviews and it's usually by system and it's as they go, you know, as required. And we review each system, you know, in detail online with visible field wells. We have construction in there. We have operations in there. We have maintenance in there. Uh, a lot of it has to be done virtually and that's fine. We got very well at the, the, those guys can sit out at the plant and we can run the model from back here and, and do virtual. We also have a lot of technology where we bring in, if it's existing plant, we bring in the laser scans and we can actually blend those into the model so that you can see in the uh, reality capture scenario, here's the new stuff, here's the old stuff, here's how it's going together, here's how it fits, here's what needs to be removed. So a lot of tools in our box that, that we can use to manage that detailed design. Okay, Great. Dan, turn All it right. over to you. Sure. So I've been using this word target value delivery and I mentioned expected cost and target cost. So this, this gives a, a little bit clearer perhaps sense of on the left, uh, the multiple party contract, owner, general contractor, designer, suppliers, trades, um, a single contract uh, could be IPD, it could be progressive design build with the owner off to the side. Um, we like to do co-location. Uh, it's been challenging during COVID, uh, still is. Uh, some team members are co-located, mostly not. Uh, virtual co-location is working uh, for the most part and, and can be very effective. Uh, we do something called a big room, uh, which is not just a big room, uh, but it is the, it's the mindset of all of our, our meeting place all of, it's, it's the town square for the project. All of our stuff is here. It's on the walls, and we do virtual big rooms. Uh, we're doing one for one of our projects right now in uh, in Maryland, and uh, the you know the schedule, the, the the pull plans are on there. The milestone plan, pull plan, phase pull. Uh, there a lot of the plus delta work that we're doing. I uh, the A threes are in there. 
all the things you need, anything you need to be able to see to make a visual workplace. Collaboration, as you've seen, is the key word. And <clears throat> during this phase of design, we're driving to the target cost. So the, the expected cost is after we've done the validation and we kind of figured out what, what are the elements of this going to be, we still have open sets perhaps, uh, but we know about what the ranges are and we figure we can do it for this amount of money and it will meet the owner's budget. Uh, then the fun begins. Then we're driving to a target cost. How do you pick it? Generally, the team selects the target cost with the owner maybe having an extra thumb on the scale. Uh, in one particular case, uh, uh, a private hospital company, a hospital corporation, uh, was building a hospital in California. Uh, the average bed cost at that time was around a million dollars, uh, a little over a million dollars. It's probably twice that now uh, per bed. And the owner challenged the team, an IPD team, to do it for, I think it was 855000 a bed. Now, that's a lot of money, I know, but that's what hospitals cost, especially in California. And uh, and so the, the team talked it over and said, yep, we'll do it. And so they uh, they locked in on a target cost and they, and they drove toward it and actually beat it. A simple example of how they did it during construction is... Uh, no, I won't do that because that's the next, next group coming up. Sorry, Fernando. I almost <laughs> I almost let the cat out of the bag. Hey, your passion uh, is showing, though. You want me to? Yeah, well, you know, get wound up. Uh, yeah. So it, eventually, the final cost, which is what we were talking about earlier today, the final cost is going to be even lower than the target cost because everybody keeps looking for ways to do it a little less expensively without sacrificing quality or value and still keeping to a very aggressive schedule. I think there's one more slide. So this is just a, an idea of what the cluster groups might look like. Um, uh, you can see there's a core group uh, in the center of that. Those are typically uh, managers uh, for the various entities, uh, the project managers for the various entities. The SMT, the, the, the senior management team uh, above that is at least owner, designer, contractor. It may be a couple of other people who are major uh, signers of this, uh, have a major chunk of this project. Uh, they oversee the core group, but the core group then, uh, a member of the core group is the, uh, the leader, uh, or at least the assistant leader of each of the uh, cluster groups. And we've talked about what their form and function is. Perfect. Okay. okay. Uh, Fernando, I think we want to skip the moderator question and go straight to the next stage. Okay, let's let's do that. All right. So uh, the uh, we had a couple of comments here from Fish. Um, I'm going to I'm going to uh, go to the the next one. So from a procurement and supply chain integration perspective, uh, what lean ADP approach is applied and why is it effective? So we're going to start out with uh, Dan on this one. Sure, and uh, we actually shouldn't have because Fish is way better at uh, at all the details in procurement. But this is a this is an example. This is the closest thing I've got to one of John's uh, multi-word diagrams. Um, this is uh, a, a, a financial management and lean supply chain integration plan uh, that we developed in uh, in a project uh, in, uh, several years ago. And uh, it, the idea was, was metrics for everything and continuous improvement all along the way. The, as you can see, the bottom uh, blue versus lean supply chain scope, uh, that points to those two middle to second and fourth uh, dotted line circles of strategic sourcing and distrib distribution. And uh, the part on the top, financial management scope, and its red lines point to the first, third, and fifth of those diagrams uh, about forecasting and, and then uh, moving to strategic sources and, and, and then pro contract procurement and then distribution and then accounts payable. Uh, so we, the, the lean approach is, uh, you know, full accountability. Um, and, but, but in this particular case, these projects were going to move very quickly. 
And one of the problems, you know, cash is the currency of performance in construction. Uh, and one of the problems in design and construction is slow pay. And nobody wins, uh, literally. I mean, not even the owner. Nobody wins in slow pay. And so they were going to do what they called pencil draws. They were going to, it, it was open book, like IPD is. Uh, so everybody knew what everybody was was spending. And everybody got paid their cost. And uh, and so they were going to see what the costs had been for a for a month and and validate that but not audit it and go ahead and approve payment and get payment out there a couple of weeks kind of thing uh and then over the period of a few months they would settle up uh if the pencil draw was a little over or a little under they would settle up so the whole concept of lead supply chain integration is to try to uh, integrate all the lean principles of of accountability and respect uh, and continuous improvement uh, into the process of demand sourcing, procurement, distribution, and payment. All right, thank you. Okay, let's let's jump into uh, fish. Okay, the again, I, I keep going back to interactive planning, but I, I probably I, I think Dan did it right. I should have put the the uh, my procurement milestone here. Uh, we we have a, a really rigorous process in in FEL2. We come up with what we call a procurement strategy. We list all the things we think we need to buy, and we're going to come up with a strategy. Is this going to be sole source? Is it going to be competitively bid? Is it going to be internationally competitively bid? Because all these things have a different factor on, on the project, depending on the schedule. In the case of international, uh, do you have enough time for this shipping? You know, Is there enough, enough room in there to allow for the shipping and some of the issues related to international sourcing? Um, uh, is is cost cost your driver or is schedule your driver comes into play here? But anyway, we come up with a strategy. After we come up with a strategy, the next thing we start go to is a detailed sourcing plan where we start listing out every order and the tags that we think are going to be on every order, and and how we're going to manage that. And we actually prioritize those, you know, with some kind of a, a schedule and lead time and etc. And when we're doing that. And that, that feeds in, by the way, to our interactive planning. But the thing you want, most people look at, when they talk about lead time, when is it going to be a, arrive on site? Uh, one of our biggest criti critical issues is when are my design team going to get the vendor data? I can't design that foundation without that vendor data. I need to know how big that pump is, where the where the, the bolt holes are, what the torque is on that pump, et cetera. So vendor data, at nine times out of ten, is the driving factor for me. Then that gets into your big milestone that when am I going to have funding? to actually place this order and in most cases in today's world the funding to place the order is probably too late based on the lead time that I need for vendor data and or delivery so what we have to do we have to make some decisions early are we going to buy engineering can we go out and buy the engineering for this pump and get the vendor data we may have to cancel it if the project for one reason or another goes south, but nine times out of 10, the project is gonna go forward. The trick is how am I gonna get the jump on vendor data and give my designers what they need? You know, you're back to this, if you want this from me, what do I need from you? I need vendor data. You're gonna hear that from every one of my designers. So our biggest challenge is get the designers the vendor data they need in time to do their portion of the project. Uh, and that goes all back to that milestone planning thing I was telling you about 17 steps to buy something can i whittle that down to eight nine ten can i reach the compress the the durations from 10 days down to two days you know what can i do there and 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 to play dan you you talk about uh, integrated project planning uh, i have projects where we actually bring these subject matter experts into the office like you're saying if they're yeah. working with me in the office they don't need two weeks we can go no. sit out with them and i can approve that thing in one day you know yeah. so that bubble but if i got to take that bubble and transmit that thing all the way out to, to Tim, Tim, and it sits on his desk for a week or two, and he might or might not get around to it. Then, then I'm I'm up a creek. So yeah, integrated project planning I think is is really really or delivery is really really critical here. So that supply chain, that procurement supply chain is really critical. And what the killer is when the owner wants to buy things and he 
his procurement team has no stake in that project. And I'm seeing that happen more and more. If the procurement guy does not have stake in the project, you've got a real mitigation problem and your schedule is going to get blown all over the place. And there's really not much you can do about it, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, and, and John, we, we complicate that one step further because we have maybe 40 vendors, 40 trade contractors, maybe yeah. 80 on a project. Each of them has a series of, of suppliers and vendors. Yeah. Uh, how do you do, you know, master planning and, and scoping and, and all that with, with the, all of this spread out the way it is? Yeah. It's pretty challenging. Yeah. Yeah, procurement is the major constraint, major yeah. challenge. Well, you're already projects. jumping into the next question, so keep going. Well, well, there we go. <laughs> what challenges do you experience? That, so that, that's that's definitely a that's definitely a challenge. Is is the is it's a tower of Babel, uh, you know? Yeah. I mean, everybody speaks different languages. Nobody's computers talk to each other. Uh, it, it it everybody uses different systems. Uh, and now that you throw the, the COVID uh, supply chain disruptions in the middle of it and, uh, and get a ship wedged in the Suez, oh, my yeah, Lord, what are we going to do for the you know, now? What are we going to do? Yeah. Uh, I mean, everybody is, is focused on supply chain and procurement. And, uh, and as an industry, as a group of industries, we don't have a real good answer yet. Uh, and, uh, and, and we need to... Uh, we need to figure this out, but that's the big, that's the big thing, and all the diagrams in the world ain't going to solve that. I'll be quiet now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think uh, I think you may have um, added these slides, uh, Fish. I, I had put those in there, and I pretty much talked about those. That little, you know, in other words, that procurement team may or may not be invested in the project. And they're not available for early planning. Like I said, those guys up in New Jersey, you know, they're they're not available for early planning. They're just you're gonna you're gonna make some uh, package, you're gonna send it up there, and it's gonna sit on their desk, and they're gonna get around to putting it out for inquiry when they get around to putting it in inquiry. And your project is no no more important than anybody else's, you know. So so there's a lot of issues there. Uh, so we've really got a like I said, it's just a problem and we have to realize it, we have to mitigate it, and we have to, it's a risk. Your project is a risk on the procurement side. Yeah, constantly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and But the great thing about AWP is you have all the other stuff kind of tamped down. You've got yeah. it systematized and you right. know what's missing and, and all that sort of thing. I mean, we do barcoding and and there yeah. are plenty of vendors that have systems that scan things in and out, and, and we know where everything is, and it's RFID tags and all that stuff. But uh, you got to get it first. Yeah. Yeah. I'll also mention, uh, you know, what Bruce and, and John Strickland said earlier. Uh, you know, when especially in procurement, everything looks like a transaction, and so yeah. uh, you know, I, I have this cost-driven mentality uh, versus a project value mentality, yeah. and, and that and that integration participation mentality. So uh, I think that's part of the one of the bigger challenges that we have, and uh, you know that's something we need to overcome. I think in, in both sides, lean or AWP. Okay, um, now let's move on to the to the next question. It's probably a big one here, but let's talk about uh, uh, construction planning and scheduling. Right, we're still in the design phase, uh, getting out detailed uh, design and engineering. So what lean ADP approaches is applied at this at this stage and why is it effective prior to construction? So we'll start out with uh, with fish. Okay, and, and we go back and we kind of talked about it earlier, but our, our CWPs, we get in, you know, we start out with CWPs. Now, engineering, after the interactive planning, their job is to take that CWP and, and break that into engineering work packages and, and really break it down and put, and, and we're going to schedule by engineering work package. So the, they're going to work, they're going to focus on production. Um, the uh, deliverables, uh, are identified early and we have earned milestone based on you know is it a complete design in check issued for approval mm -hmm. you know issued for construction so they got to earn value based on that uh, personally I, I'm not a big fan of earned value I, what I do like from lean is the uh, is it done yes or no 
uh, yeah. more of a commitment base. Uh, earn value, you can play, you know, you can get up to that 90% point, and then it's 91%, and then it's 92%, and it's 92 and a half, you know, so so I'm not a big <laughs> earn value guy, really come right down to it. I want to know, is it done? Yes or no? Uh, we do inter additional interactive planning sessions. You've done that one up there in the front end planning, and it looked pretty good. Now, reality is set in and uh, you've gone down the road a little bit and you find out that the the cloud formation that you thought was a really nice one is, isn't so nice and the wind starts blowing and thunder starts clapping so we, we need to get back in the room and this is where i would like to do more of the big room that you talked about Dan. we yeah. we have done that on a couple of projects that was very successful our problem is we don't have a big room uh, it, it's yeah. hard for us to find a big room to put all this stuff up, but I really like the big room concept where you can walk in there in the morning. Everybody can walk in at any time, see exactly where you are. What we've done in our big room in the past is we took our interactive planning with all the stickies and everything, and we you know, lock them down and then we'll actually put those up on the wall and then you can walk in there. Okay, it's July. Here's what we said we were going to do. How are we doing? You know, yeah. and, and, and in some cases, we have to go in and start rearranging some stickies and say, look, yeah. we need plan B. The plan A ain't working like, like we thought it was for one reason or another. So I'd like to adopt more of the big room approach. Yeah. Well, you can do it virtually, but uh, I'll, I'll show you a, a, a small big room okay. that you can do anywhere. So good. Okay. Yeah. It's definitely a purposeful type event just to actually create the big room. Right. Yeah. It's not, yeah. uh, we're just not going to populate a conference room that's going to be no. for other purposes too. It, so that's the deal. Don't want a conference room because it probably has a big table in it. Yeah. And that kills yeah. collaboration. Well, I'll tell you what, we we did. We had room on a couple of projects and we put all that stuff on the wall and it was great. I mean, everybody yeah. loved it. You know, you just don't get to do that very often. As long as you keep it up to date. Yep. All right. Okay. Fish, you go ahead. I'm done. Yours. Okay, there we go. Let me put these back. I think this is a repeat. And um, I just more on the interactive problem. I'm not going to dwell on that one. Uh, this one, uh, this one really, uh, I had meant for this one to be in Dan because Dan is going to show you the last planter system. And I wanted to show how similar his last planter says is to this one. So if you would go to Dan's first. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this what, damn, you want okay? rebuttal? Is that what you're saying? You, you, well, 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 you rearranged I, I deliberately stuck it after yours just so I can show you how similar oh, they are. And somebody <laughs> slipped up. All right. Yeah. So we talked about the first two bubbles there, milestone and phase pool yeah. planning, as the 30,000 and 10,000 foot view of those things. Now, the bottom three bubbles are really ground level. The plane has landed. We are doing this. Uh, so there is... Uh, uh, what we can do, we see what we should do. That's what we plan. Yes. Now, what we can do <clears throat> is called look ahead planning or make work ready planning. And that's where we identify any of the things that are missing, any constraints missing. You know, do we have enough labor, materials, equipment? Uh, is the site ready? Uh, all that stuff. Uh, then we make a commitment in a weekly work plan what we will do. And each individual trade foreman makes their promises day by day, five, six days a week, however many days they're working, they make their promises. I'll, on Monday, on in this area, I'm doing this. And in that area, I'm doing that. And all the way through. And then at the end of the week or the beginning of the next week, we look back on the on the week and, and see what we did. How'd we do? Uh, if we had promised to do 100 things and we got 80 of them done, then we calculate the PPC percent of plan complete, and it's 80%. Remember, the average, the monkey score is 54%. Everybody in the industry does 54%. Half the time, they get it right. Uh, here, we're really learning from it, and, and we're also asking the five whys. Why do on the ones we missed? Why, 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 why? Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, actually, uh, one thing you have. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want you to go back to my slide oh, now. Yeah. Go back yeah. to my slide. There. Now, look at this. Should do, like to do, can do, will do, did do. I mean, yes. they're almost in line. And I Brothers made this from another mother. 10 years ago, you know, so without looking at last planter, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so they're very similar. It's an idea whose time has come, John. Yes. 
Yeah. Hey, Dan, uh, one thing if you could do is is uh, talk a little about how, uh, app, applying this into the design and engineering phase, because I've seen that used effectively. Sure. Well, you actually you can go to the next slide and it it's showing a construction, but it, this could these could be designers. Uh, so what, what we're doing here is is <clears throat> those are the weekly boards. Every column is a day. The ones that are lined out are Saturday and Sunday. This team happens to meet in the middle of the week. Uh, and this is one team on the left and another team in the corner. And, and they're doing a daily check in 15 minutes a day, not 20. Did you do that? Did you do that? Did you do that? What are you doing tomorrow? Uh, and and it's the, it's similar in design, except designers typically will do it with Kanban boards. That's where you have a uh, work to do, work in process, work done. Uh, and so they'll they'll have their week's work uh, in the in you know work to do side of the board, and they'll move it one at a time into what they're working on currently and then what's done. So there's a variety of ways to do it, but it's similar uh, in, in both cases. Perfect. Let me jump in there too, Fernando. We we yeah. uh, we have something, so we're not as visual. We haven't done, I've tried to get these, uh, there's even a word for it, but to get the board visual boards up and have not been very successful. What we have done is we've taken our, our P6 schedule on engineering and design, and we've actually got that into a, a, a spreadsheet format. And you can sort it by uh, uh, in two or four week increments. And every week, every Monday, we sit down and say, just like you did, what did we do? say we were going to do last week? What did we actually do? What's coming up in the next two weeks? Are we on board? Do we have everything we need to do that? Or do we need to take some extra steps to get you what you need so that you'll be able to make that commitment? And, and that works very well. And what we found is nobody, and I mean nobody, in the design world or engineering world wants to read a primavera schedule no. it just ain't going to happen you know no. so you've either got to make it visual either with some kind of an easy to read spreadsheet that will sort out their task for this yeah. period or you've got to have something visual on a board if you yeah. want them to interact with you yeah and and john one other thing about this is that for on the construction side of it it's got to be daily meetings because those tags mm -hmm. get moved you, you talk yeah. about going in and, and things have changed. Change thing, Things change every day in the field. Yeah. So those tags have to get adjusted. And this has always got to be real. In the design right. world, it, it changes, but more on a weekly basis rather than yeah. a daily basis. In both cases, we do weekly check-ins and we look back and see what's done and not done and how we have to adjust. Good. Nice. Okay. Yeah, so here's the moderated question. You've already started talking about it. What is similar and what would you blend into an ADP Lean project? So Fish, uh, you've already talked about the big room. What else do you think uh, uh, from ADP's perspective? Well, the the, the more, I, I like more visual planning on the engineering side. I really like to get, there are, I have some methodologies and some tools, you know, that will help. They're very similar to what you've shown here. Uh, I have not been very successful in getting our controls people to implement those they like schedules they like that they just they're just enamored with p3 six schedules and i can't convince them that nobody wants to read your doggone schedule <laughs> so not making very much progress there so i think lean lean has some better tool visual tool sets that we could use and, uh, and there are electronic programs that do that and and uh yeah. we can talk about those later for for me fernando it's uh it's the constraints <laughs> prevention uh, you know, we we do constraint mitigation uh, on, on that look ahead schedule to make work ready uh, for the next several weeks. We actually try to make work ready six weeks out or at least yeah. three weeks out uh, and, and see where the dragons are in the future and get those stomped out right now. Um, but but if we're using AWP, uh, we would prevent those constraints. We would already know that we have that checklist and all the yeses are are checked and and the material has been received and it's scanned in and it's sitting right there and all that sort of thing so i think that's something that we could uh, really pull in yeah i agree with that uh, that that constraint removal process relieves a lot of frustration downstream yeah. you know uh, so the earlier we can tackle it and get dedicated folks to to, to work on the things that that either the design team or the foreman you know just don't shouldn't be bothering with yeah so 
Yes, absolutely. So any other comments or thoughts on that? Well, I might I might throw one more thing in that you're talking about strength free. I, I keep going back to pipe fabrication, steel fabrication is kind of our one of our biggest pinch points. And we actually put uh, I, I put inspectors in in each of the fab shops and to inspect the quality. Because when it, when it hits the job site, it's got to be right. You know, there's no time to to, to you know, is it here up? Oh, it doesn't look right. You got to send it back. That's not going to happen. So I've got inspectors in there. And I use inspectors as my eyes and ears for for expediting and and like. You you said then things in the field are going to change on a daily basis they really do so we've got some priorities of pipe and everything my inspectors are going to keep me informed my expediter informed that hey they are working on the right things at the right time and then guess what the field comes up and says you know what there's a big rain and we're going to be washed out over here we're not going to be able to work in that area for another three weeks but man if we could get this pipe over here we could you know shift our crew over so boy we go into and we're now we're messing with the fab shop but yep. I mean, it's a necessary messing with the fab shop. So my inspectors and expediters go in there, work with the fab shop, and start rejuggling those priorities again, and make sure they get right. So, so yeah, it's it's a production production planning in pipe fabrication and steel fabrication is very very critical. Yeah, I think so. And I, I would also add, from an ADP perspective, there there are certainly tools that you know, that play into this. We've already talked about a few target value delivery. You know, there's there's other tools like choosing by advantages. A3 was mentioned. You know, so so there's a lot of things that could come into the engineering, the visual planning um, yeah. processes. And I I think that we could take advantage of that. And and from from the lean perspective, Dan, you know, you mentioned uh, there's there's some process and structure that really lend to itself and and uh, constraint removal management. Yeah. Uh, I think is a big yeah. thing that ADP brings. Root, root cause analysis is a, we haven't talked about it, but it is a yeah. huge tool yeah. all, all the way through. I mean, we do it in design, we do it definitely in in the, the construction side, and to, because what happens is those of us who've been around a while, we see a problem happen. It, it's similar to something that happened before. I know what that problem is, and I know how to solve it. And it's BS because this is different. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yeah. we jump to conclusions without doing a disciplined root cause analysis to find out the real cause and fix that. Uh, so yeah. there are a lot of tools like that. Yeah, right? and I think I think one thing uh, that that brings to mind now is establishing that learning environment that we learned about yesterday. Is that we have if we establish a learning culture, especially on the ADP perspective, we will drive these better solutions because it will it will start making sense. By the way, I want to go back okay. to earned value. As you know, I'm not a big earned value fan, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and uh, earned value a lot of times by getting a certain amount of pipe to field, you know, you got earned value, you know? Wrong. Yeah, I've got I got cases where I've had 60% of the pipe delivered to the field, and I'll be damned if I could find two pieces to fit together. You know, <laughs> there's no value at all, you know? <laughs> I yeah. want the 10 pieces that fit together, not the 80%. That don't. Yeah. So, and but I got, got story got after story of that crap, you know? <laughs> But you got paid. Okay, perfect. I think we're at the point where uh, where we can start opening up uh, questions. Steve, could you throw up Slido, please? We have some leftover too. We do. Yeah. So uh, let's take a look at uh, that question is so old. Here. It's now afternoon. Huh. <laughs> so. So we've got uh, the first question is, what does respect for people plan look like? How is it different from the original respect for people guidance principle? So at the center of, of, of lead, you know, with continuous improvement and all these things, at the center of it is respect for people. And we've used that as a, as a watchword and as kind of a guiding principle uh, since it's found you know, for, for 20 years, 30 years. The problem we realized this year is we don't live it because what happens is our, our, you know, we, if you go to a construction site and you look where the workers are use, are going to the toilet, that does not show respect. No one, no human being wants to go into a toilet on a construction site unless it's the toilets for the office. Now, pardon me for talking dirty here, but I was on a I was on a project a couple of years ago and, and I was working in the office, the trailer, office trailer. And I said, may I use the restroom? And he said, yes, it's right outside, but it's locked. Let me go out and unlock it for you. And we went out to unlock it. It was a very, not one of those really super ones. You know, it had everything inside it except a bidet, right? It was one of those kind of really great facilities. 
And, uh, and the guy opens it up and I start to walk in and a construction worker walks in. And he says, the, the thing, I, I'm not gonna use the word he used, but the toilet is broken. Uh, may I use this toilet? And the guy said, no, this is for supervisors. That is not respect for people. Uh, respect for people, it goes into the inclusion and diversity, uh, you know, uh, not just percentages, but actually involving people uh, at the table, uh, race, creed, uh, nationality, but also you know, that 24 year old that just got out of architecture school or engineering school or construction management school and has no experience but really knows how all the software works, showing that person respect by saying, show me, I'll tell you my experiences and, and get you going if you'll show me how to use this piece of software. The, the kind of mutual respect that we need to, to accommodate each other. I've got one more restroom story, okay? Oh, go good. <laughs> but but we, had a, go. we had a big quality improvement, productivity improvement, team meeting. All our managers are up there trying to figure out what can we do to improve field productivity. Finally, one guy says, have we asked the guys in the field? And the answer was no, we had not. So we went out and we asked the guys in the field, here are the top two things for improving productivity of the field. Number one, more porta potties. They were placed as such that they had to, they couldn't see if there was a line, so they had yeah. to walk all the way over. And by the time they got there, there were three people, but it's too late to walk all the way back, you know, and come back again. So they're sitting there waiting in line at a porta potty. Number two, ice water stations, refresh stations. By yeah. putting in more porta potties and and ice water stations, productivity improved like. 15 percent some ridiculous number like that you know so again listen to the people that are doing the work they know where the problems are they'll help you solve them one of the things that we've learned we, we did a, a a program in lci and the construction institute in the summer on respect for people and one of the things we learned is that that we treat we sometimes treat people one of three ways they're either vehicles for our will or they're obstacles to our will or we ignore them entirely and those three approaches to people are not respect. Yep. Right. Great. So, uh, Steve, you can clear the uh, that question, and I believe the next question we've already dealt with earlier in the day. Yes. <clears throat> so let's um, let's talk about the post-it thing because there's another one down there that says, "Are there any?" tools that could replace the manual IPP process, uh, it mm -hmm. still feels very outdated. And let me talk about that. And the answer is yes. Uh, I mean, you can use Excel. You can use Excel with the post-its. We've done that before. Uh, Mural, as, as we know, uh, uh, Lloyd, we've been using that. And that's another really good tool that, that can be used for the post-its. And, and, and they're all okay if, and, and I'm going to put a qualifier. I'm going to say, okay, if, if you're working remotely and you can't get people in the same room. But I'm telling you guys, there's something about getting the guys that are actually doing in the work in the same room, eating breakfast, taking breaks, talking to each other, mm -hmm. negotiating. You know, it's that human interaction, the getting to know each other, getting to understand the expectations, getting mm -hmm. to understand the needs. That doesn't do well. On the, uh, Mural is great for silent brainstorming, putting stuff up. It's not good for conversation. It's not good for relationship building. So I'm still an advocate of the guy writing his sticky and sticking it on the wall and talking to the guy mm -hmm next to him about that sticky. So John, the technology has, has gotten us to the point that uh, we can do both. Um, okay. Touch plan has touch screens so that you can be in the same room. Uh, a group called Niali uh, has gone a step further using a piece of hardware called the Noriva wall. And you can place like two or three of them side by side so that an entire 20 foot wall is touch sensitive. And, and you can project the electronic post-its in your color, turn them, move them, all that sort of thing in person, or you can do it obviously online. But uh, so they're, they're, you know, Bosch has a great system, um, uh, D Planner, um, there, there's, yeah. some, there's some really great tools out there. 
Well, I'm, yeah, I'm still I'm, I'm a skeptic. I'm, I'm have to be convinced yeah. because there's something about being able to look rather than a 15 inch screen. There's something about being yeah. able to look at that 20 foot wall and walking over, and then walking back. Uh, yeah. I, I lose that when I get on a computer. I, yeah, Dan, well, Dan, Dan and I, I'll, I'll, kind of Dan and I were on a, on a, a hospital here in California together yeah. here recently, actually, yeah. uh, and we were using the planner. One of the things that you're saying, John, it absolutely makes sense, is that uh, the specialists out there that manage that every day would collect the changes that that the teams made and put them up on this board wall, and they would come up and and see where they were, add new stickies, all sorts of things. We capture that. And the next day they would have updated information because if you don't give them something that's relevant, I mean, you're right. Yeah. No one's going to look at that screen. It's too yeah. tedious. doesn't make sense. But if you get that big wall and give them current information, it, uh, it matters. Yeah. yeah. And, and in this, in the system that Fernando's talking about at Stanford, uh, one person kept the, the system running and, and made all the updates and all that, and then plotted out for each of the crews, what their, what their plan was for this week, they would update it now yet the next day here's plotted out again so it was touchy feely in the field uh actual live with your hands yeah, uh, but electronic at the same time because it made sense to that team at that time yeah. at so that it was, time it was very real yeah absolutely yeah. and steve, that's deep liner it was a great system steve could you close out uh the top one and the second one down from it because i think we've addressed both of those and uh, what I'd like to do at this point is we, we also need to do the golden nuggets exercise. And I'd like to move ahead to that. And then we'll come back and um, address additional questions until we run out of time. So um, Steve, can you set up a poll for uh, the golden nuggets? Uh, and rather than us tell you what we think the golden nuggets are, what we would like to find out from you is what you think the golden nuggets are from this session. And uh, uh, so if you could just go back into um, Slido and post what you think the golden nuggets were, and then we'll, we'll give a little bit of time for the panel to uh, review that and comment on it. We'll see if the big room gets bigger. <laughs> okay. We're rolling now, boys. Yeah. Wasn't great. I, find, I find it interesting that uh, the big room, which is a really popular concept within Lean, um, in AWP, it's often called the war room. So yeah. Yeah. we have different language about the same thing. Yeah. And I think different we connotations too. That. We tell people, don't dare call it a war room. This is not a war. You are not the enemy. <laughs> That's probably, we need to adopt that, Dan. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah. And I, I must say, um, and, and this is Lloyd speaking, this is not the timekeeper or the uh, <laughs> moderator speaking, but uh, uh, I've got to say with the panel that we've got, uh, it's really, really tough to keep this down to the required time because there's so much knowledge here and uh, you guys have done such a great job of sharing it with us. Uh, I know we're leaving a lot on the table, but uh, uh, in the time we have allotted, I think you guys have done an amazing job. Yeah, the really desired outcome here was to share, our, share these experiences and enable folks that are listening to, to want to learn more to want to investigate, uh, you know, how they can apply these things onto their project uh, and uh, map out the future of, of advancing project delivery from their perspective. Yeah, and one of the other things I would say is, I know I mentioned this earlier, but we posted 
the LCI glossary and we've posted the AWP glossary. And um, one of the things that they're talking about doing in the white paper is actually mapping across the two. Because I think in a lot of cases, we do very similar things and we call them quite different names. And in other cases, we do very uh, different things and we call them quite similar names. And I think we need to kind of coordinate and get our uh, definitions, uh, glossary more uh, universal, I guess. But uh, I think you will find that a useful resource. And uh, definitely want to thank LCI for being uh, so generous and sharing that with us. And uh, uh, CII, of course, uh, are making it available as well. So thanks to them. Okay, I, I think we've got a, a much smaller uh, response rate than I would have expected, given the number of people. Um, so if you could just take a minute, and if you haven't already, add what you personally <clears throat> saw as the gold nuggets. We'll just give it a couple more minutes, and then we'll uh, we'll comment on it. Okay, so looking at the word cloud that we've got there, what jumps out at you, team? <laughs> Respect for people. Yeah. Yeah, and collaboration and big room. I mean, clearly yeah. they're, they're all related. Uh, all related. Because, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Because the big room is heavily reliant on on people participating and collaboration yep. and this this. Yeah, equal, no rank in the room, yeah. you know, if we use a military term, that uh, everybody is equal. They all have a voice. Uh, yeah. And to me, that is that is a, a something that's 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 important. And uh, I love the fact that we have two references to toilets in our uh, golden <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's got to be a first, I, I can tell you. Yeah, cleaner and more. Yeah, John, we we uh, we went there. Doggone it! <laughs> yeah, well, you talk. Everybody talks about the, you know, what Sophia showed yesterday. How how the uh, organizations are aligned, and we're supposed to be serving the customer, which yeah. is the foreman and the and, and the crew in the field. Well, there you go. You're serving that yep. person, right? Yep. Perfect. And um, uh, is there any other poll question that you would like to ask Fernando? <laughs> Um, I think, uh, I think this is, uh, uh, this is good. I mean, I, I would like to, uh, I don't know if we, we've already done this, but you know, in a, a question of is, would you, two questions, I guess, uh, do you see, uh, a being able to apply lean to your ADP projects, uh, from this or, um, uh, and it may be or vice versa, uh, maybe it goes together, you know, would you be applying some of these AWP techniques that you've learned? Um, and uh, you know, open questions uh, somehow, Steve? but I think that would be too. Can we do that? Sure, Steve. Could you set up a question? Um, as oh, there you go. Being able to apply lean to your AWP projects. And then we'll once we finish this one, we'll go to the other question. It's interesting in the joint working group, um, I think if that question had been asked a year ago when we first got together, there would have been a number of no's and a lot more unsures and a lot fewer yeses. But I think after a year of talking about this, um, we're definitely seeing the yeses as the dominant group. Yeah, and, and it really is just exploring what it is, not that you're gonna apply something tomorrow, uh, but there are a few very, very simple things goes back to what Dan and uh, Dan and, and Fish said, hey, if you could just see what you can do tomorrow and, and did you get something done or not done, that's a really simple test, yeah. right? And once you realize how bad how bad things really are on your project, <laughs> or people can't even answer the question, I, you know, I'll tell you tomorrow afternoon what I got done is typically yeah. a response you get. So 
Well, we've just switched the question. Uh, do you see being able to apply AWP to your lean projects? Mm. And uh, to those people responding to this, I guarantee you the thought leaders are going to be looking at these after the summit ends, uh, because both LCI and uh, CII are very uh, intent on working together, and this is the kind of information they need. Yeah. And recall, this was a fairly large cross-section of of different organizations and disciplines. Yes. And a lot of owners. So uh, looking at those two, uh, I mean the AWP, applying lean to AWP, we got all yeses and unsures. We did get a few no's on the um, uh, applying AWP to lean. Just wondering if, any thoughts or comments on that from uh, either of you? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I'm what not the, surprised. Yeah, there's, there's no's in both, but I'm not sure what yeah. to make of that, Fernando. Yeah, I mean, I I think uh, the the unsures really kind of tell us the question, uh, the yeah. the issues here, uh, because from a lean to AWP, uh, clear is slightly higher. And I would expect that that folks in the ADP world, just like Fish is saying, hey, I can see where we can apply some of this uh, for sure. You know, maybe not all of it, but uh, there are there are contractual transactional things that, that sort of get in our way. Uh, but from from the ADP to lean projects, um, it's a little bit different. The projects are, are much more uh, varied in their scope and size of scopes. Uh, so what would you bring into an ADP project that that drives more structure. And I would think it'd be a little bit more of that, of the planning uh, components and, and area type management and constraint removal uh, yeah. and try out what what does a dedicated uh, planner or a what we call a CWP release coordinator, you know, that, that ensures that that bad work doesn't move downstream, right? It's a lean tenant, uh, but how would I apply that from an ADP perspective? I think is it's a fair question. So the unsurers kind of tell me, there's a component that uh, that still needs to be addressed uh, to, to to show the way, right? Because it is they're very they're they're different. They've been always thought of as different, and now we're saying okay, they can come together. And the question is, you know, I, I need to understand more. I need to see how I could do it on my type of project, whether it's a commercial, you know, a, a commercial uh, strip uh, on, on yeah. something simple versus a hospital, yeah. you know, versus a, a light manufacturing plant. Yeah. So Fernando is going to be heading up the uh, practitioner white paper. Uh, we've got a team that are going to be building that, and I think this information will be quite helpful for for him, as well as the uh, word cloud that we just uh, put together. Um, we're now sitting at uh, two minutes to the break, um, and I'm just wondering if there's any quick closing comments before we hand it over to uh, Bob. So speak now, mm -hmm. forever hold your peace. Stan, John, Fernando. I'll, I'll say one thing. Uh, I'm just testing and putting my, putting my finger up in the air and seeing which way the wind is blowing. We have more industrial owners asking about lean right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know that they're really ready for it. I don't know they understand it but they've heard about it and yeah. they're starting to look they're still looking for that magic bullet what can yeah. i do to improve my project you know performance capital capital investment so uh lean is starting to come out in in the industrial circle lean's kind of had a bad word it is mm -hmm. not had a good reputation in industry but i think the owners are starting to look this way so i think we all need to start paying a little more attention to it yeah and I want to go back to that learning environment. I mean, even today, yeah. you'd be an ADP for how many years you've been and and lean and how many years, it doesn't matter. But every time we do this, we learn a little bit more, 
even yeah. about what we're supposed to be specialists in. And yeah. I think if everybody takes that attitude, you know, hey, uh, I learned something today. It's not just an entertainment. How do I apply it? Uh, and that's what I think a learning culture uh, brings to the table. So, Dan, anything you want to add to that? No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think I think the the bridge is education. Yeah, the bridge is learning. Right. Uh, about each Amazing. other, about about what, you know, and 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 a little bit of self reflection. Yeah, reaching across the aisle and shaking hands. There yep, you go. Exactly. It's not, I, can't, I can't get that zebra thing out of my. Head. <laughs> I was going to say that was the next thing. Gentlemen, thank you very much for the for your session. Uh, if uh, you could put up, Steve, the uh, summary of the uh, early Slido poll this morning uh, in terms of number of uh, participants and years of experience, uh, I think that kind of reinforces what we were talking about here at the end. Uh, and uh, we thank you all. We're going to take a, a break for an hour for lunch, uh, and we're going to come back and do the second part of all of this. Uh, with a, a, a new panel uh, and uh, look forward to your participation at that time. We thank again our sponsors and all of our uh, all of our panelists for their presentation. Thank you and have a good lunch. See you. Thanks for thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, Bob. Thank you guys. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Thank you, Bob. Take care. <laughs>